weird. You have a lot of stage to play with. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Hey. Uh. Hi. How's it going? Oh. It doesn't feel like it's like we were just we were here a year ago, but it feels like it was just yesterday. Moments, like moments ago, and now here you are. Thank you for helping us out with that. No, please, of course. So I really just uh, came, was shooting last night, jumped on a plane, came here this morning. Um, to say, uh, give you an update, let you know how we're doing. Uh, and I uh, couldn't be happier with the way everything's going. It's super amazing, just the, the talent and the, the sets and the special effects and everything is going amazingly well and, and I couldn't be happier. Um, you know, I, normally when people come to these things, they well, we, you know, normally bring some shots, some footage, or something. Oh, I know, I know. But you know, we're shooting right now, so I mean, don't play with me. Don't play with me. Footage from the old George Reeves Batman. You're like, remember this? <laughs> Good night. Okay. Da, 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 da. Anyway, so yeah, I guess it's a little teaser. It's a teeny little thing. So maybe we just take a quick look and check it out. It looks pissed. Throw it again. Is your mic? Is your mic not throw it? Bam. Anything? Oh, there you go. Sorry. I shut it off during because I was. Oh, they comment. Anyway, so yeah, uh, put a little something together, but also I thought I'd bring a couple of my <laughs> Superman. They were saying gigawatt because we didn't know back then that it's a hard G. Oh, uh, <laughs> Welcome, how you doing, man? It's good to see you. <laughs> so, what's going on, man? How are you? It's good to see you, man. Good to see you too. How are you enjoying Comic Con so far? Oh, but I haven't been out, out, out on the floor yet, but I'm going. Yeah, are you gonna walk? Are you, can you just walk the floor? Well, I, with a mask on. <laughs> just, uh, Chewbacca. Take your, Chewbacca. Take your clothes off, man. Like it's Magic Mike cosplay. <laughs> So let's talk a little about Jupiter Ascending. Uh, uh, Mila Kunis and Sean Bean, obviously, uh, uh, are also in the film. Tell us a little bit about what it's what it's been like to work on the movie and what people can expect. Uh, well, it's with Wachowski, so I mean, you never know what you're gonna get with them. They're they're absolutely out of their minds. I mean, we really tried to do something different, something that you've never seen before. It's not a you know, it's obviously not a book or a comic or anything. So they've really, really tried to push it. Yeah, and uh, obviously Mila couldn't be here. Uh, yeah, she's uh, super pregnant. <laughs> super, super pregnant. pregnant. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ashkies are actually shooting a TV show. They would have loved to be here as well. So they say sorry. I think people are fine with the fact that you're here. You're nice. Uh... Does it feel weird? Do you feel like weirdly exposed with seven thousand people screaming and you're standing there? I feel like, weird. The oh, oh come here, Channing Tatum. It's all right. You're gonna be fine. Well, now since you're over here, we're gonna take a picture. <laughs> Did you? Let's, show, let's look at this stuff. I know that's that's giant. You? Do you want to? Did you bring any footage? You want to show people something? Yeah, let's uh, let's play it. Yeah, I'm playing off my. Let's play some footage from Jupiter Ascending. You're gonna get to hang out there. You're gonna get to go out there and see some stuff while you're here. All right, Channing Tatum may or may not be walking around on the floor, but please thank me. What Channing Tatum, everyone? Have a huge day. Oh my god, so much! And we're only like, we, have to, we just started! Uh, so now there's another segment, we're gonna change all the side things. Some sound effects. Hello! Do I have a, have a seat? Sure. It is an honor to meet you, sir. Uh, we did not get to meet backstage, but it's nice to see you. Uh, congratulations on Mad Max, and tell us uh, 
why, what was your decision to sort of revisit the, the franchise after all this time? Here? Yes, yeah. sir. The, the story popped in my head and just wouldn't get away. Uh, like an imaginary friend, it just wouldn't go away. And uh, I uh, always, you know, I love chase movies. I think they're the kind of purest form of cinema. That's where the film language started. I wanted to make one long extended chase and to see what we could pick up about the characters and the story on the way. Does it feel, um, did it feel familiar to be back in this world or did it feel new to you? What was the, after all this time, what did it, what did it seem like? Both ways. Um, it was certainly familiar, uh, but a lot of time has passed, the technology's changed. Um, it was a real opportunity to go back and revisit it. So, uh, you know, it was a really interesting thing to do. Crazy, but interesting. So, uh, talk a little about uh, like the Tom Hardy and Charlize and Nicholas Holt. Like, what, when you're building the cast, what is it that you're trying to accomplish with these actors? Well, you know, you, people often say that 75% of your job is done as a director when in the casting. So it's very specific to characters. Obviously, I was waiting for someone uh, like Tom Hardy to come along. It has all those sort of qualities. And Charlize, uh, when eventually, I hope you get to see the movie, you'll know uh, there's certain dimensions of Charlize which exactly f fit the character of Furiosa. So, and the same in many ways with, uh, with, with Nick Holt. Yeah. So that applies to all of it. So that. But by the way, can I say this is my first Comic Con? Are you serious? Another another quality that is kind of like watching a big wild animal. You just don't know what they're going to do next. And I think that's the, the, the paradox is the big is is one of the elements of charisma. And so yeah. The, I've been lucky I've worked with some wonderful actors. Were you surprised <clears throat> when the film came over to the States in 1980 and became like a complete smash success? Yeah, I'm surprised whenever there's a success. You work so hard in a movie and you look at it and you put it out there and you have no idea how it's going to be received. And, uh, you know, had you told me when we, that I'd be making another one all these years later, I would have, I just would not have believed you. I would have thought you were crazy. So obviously the film relies heavily on the vehicles. Um, so tell us a little bit about the designing the vehicles and, and what your vision was for that. Well, one of the, one of the key things, as I said before, if, if from uh, next Wednesday, all the bad things we hear in the news started to happen, economic collapse and so on and so on, uh, and, and you go forward about 45 years, all the remaining artifacts including the vehicles, would be those that you could sort of resurrect. So we, when we, so one of the things we had to do with all our designers and so on is say, okay, you can only base it on, on uh, real vehicles and those more likely to survive. So anything with too much technology, anything with too many computers and uh, electricals and so on, it has to be, you know, older technology. And, and, and uh, so that, that was the kind of rule that we use. So when you see the vehicles, you'll recognize the anti scenes. Excellent. Uh, I think we have a question here. Hey, man, what's your name? Mike. Hey, Mike, what's your question? Uh, yeah, my question was just, it's been so long since the last uh, movie in the franchise came out, and I was just wondering, has your life experience since then, now everything that's... Uh, that you've done, has that influenced the way you've approached this? Have you taken a different approach with this film than you have with the previous ones? That's a good question, Mike. Well, no, that's a great question. Uh, uh, to answer it truthfully, I'd have to be very revealing. Uh, I would say, yeah, I hope, you know, I, I really think what happens is you've got to put all your skills and wisdom into your work. It's got to bleed you dry and you put it up there somehow for better and for worse. And I hope that I've matured. I, I, I mean, you know, I'm one of those people quite fascinated about how the world evolves. I think we all are, and some of it's incredibly inspiring, and some of it's kind of scary. And I, you know, and you try to get that into your work. Um, I look back at the old films, and I can't 
I can barely remember how I understood how to make them. Uh, I, was, I was working out of instinct, and when I got to this movie, and you end up going out there for over a hundred days, crashing vehicles in an African desert, and stunt after stunt after stunt with, with uh, in a lot of cases, with cast doing the stunt, uh, you kind of lose any sense of yourself, and you're just working off instinct and gut. So, so you know how much that has changed. I don't know. It remains to be seen. Um, I feel like maybe. Thanks what, for the question. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I feel like uh, before we get to the next question, um, what you were just talking about might be better reflected in footage. Did you bring some footage that you would like to show? Yeah, we did. We did bring some footage, uh, and it's the first time anybody in this world has seen any of Fury Road. Yeah. Fantastic! Thank you, Jeff. We still. Well, first, so can you tell? What can you tell us about Charlize's character? Oh, she's. Uh, I can tell her you, you her name, uh, Imperator Furiosa. Imperator Furiosa. Okay. Uh, she's. Uh, she's the chief or boss of a war rig, the, the big war rig, which races across the wasteland, and they're. Um, and Max, the guy who just wants to be himself, he thinks that's the best way to survive, gets swept up in, in, in their story. Excellent. So, yeah. Um, let's have a couple more questions. Hi, what's your name? Hey, how's it going? My name's Joe. Hey, Joe. Um, so, if I remember correctly, Mad Max was made for a budget of about $400,000 back in 79. Yeah. Um, Hollywood was a very different beast at that point. It is completely different now. Um, you developed an iconic character, and I now know you want to tell a completely different story. Are you able to do that in this environment, or as Tina Turner said, do we really need another hero? Well, actually she said we don't need another hero, but you know. <laughs> say now is uh, like how you know did you find in this uh, in this Hollywood climate was it it was it an easier film to make or was it more enjoyable or less enjoyable what was the experience uh, the, the first one the first movie Mad Max was the toughest movie I ever had to make uh, the budget was low but more importantly I really didn't know it was the first movie set I'd ever been on except for a short I'd made so I didn't know what to expect by the time I got here, I know knew a lot more, uh, you know, what to expect. Um, but I, basically, I'm definitely able to make the movie I want to make. Um, the you know, we've been making movies now with Warner Brothers for since that first Mad Max, and they've been, um, you know, they they allow the filmmakers their process, and and uh, the. This is definitely the film I, I want to make. Um, you know, the movie in my head, and this has always been the case, is never quite the movie that you get out there 100%, but this is very high up there, very high percentage of it's realized, and I'm you know, very happy about that. But you're absolutely right, the world has changed. The world has changed radically. I mean, with the very first Mad Max, we didn't have video split. We didn't know, we, we took a, it took a, over a week before we saw our dailies, you had no idea what you, you, you'd shot. Uh, now you see it immediately, so you can be more refined, and, and so on, and now you've got... And also, I believe we as audiences have changed. We're able to apprehend cuts much, much faster um, than, than we have been in the past. If you look at some of the movies back then, they are rhythmically s slower. And if, if, you, if you think of... Movies like um, music, uh, the tempos have increased, and we're able to read even from being little babies and little kids a lot, lot sooner, a lot, lot more quicker. So things have changed. Excellent. Uh, hey, what's your name? Hi, uh, my name's Andy. Uh, great to meet you, number one. Woo! Uh, Woo! Thirty years for a film like this to come out. So thank you very much. 
when I heard it was being made, I actually had this uh, jersey made. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. <laughs> and just seeing yeah. the clip uh, kind of changes my question, but there are elements of the last two films within Fury Road, and I just want to know tonally how does Fury Road fit within the original trilogy? Uh, I'd say I'd say it's closer to uh, Mad Max 2 or Road Warrior, uh, simply because it, it happens over a short period of time, over a few days, and it, as I said, it's an extended chase, and that's sort of tonally what uh, Mad Max 2 was. Mad Max 1 was more of a story, you know, family story and so on. Mad Max 2 was a hybrid of those. So I'd say it's, it's definitely closer. Excellent. Thanks, man. All right, great. Um, so, uh, movie comes out in May next year. Where are you in the process right now? Well, I get on a plane tomorrow night and uh, tell people about what I've experienced in uh, Comic Con. I couldn't believe when we drove in the people and so on. Uh, I'll take those memories back home. I go straight into the recording session. Tom uh, is recording with a big orchestra on Tuesday. And uh, it's um, Tom Holkenberg's doing the score, Junkie XL, a really strong score. And um, so that's what we're doing. And we're pretty soon we'll be mixing it together and tidying up a few things. And uh, we'll, it'll be bye bye to Fury Road for me. <laughs> and then as you're sort of winding down, can you tell us about any of the other characters, anything else we can expect to see in the film? Um, oh, God, there's a lot of characters. Uh, the interesting thing, uh, might as well come out with it now, the, you saw the guy called Imperator, uh, sorry, uh, um, Immortan Joe, uh, the guy with the long hair and the mask, uh, that's uh, Hugh Keys Burns, who, who 30 years ago uh, played the toe cutter and died at the end of that movie, and uh, it was great. I thought, if you're in a mask, you know, people won't confuse it, so... Uh, <laughs> So, so uh, Hugh Giesman plays the uh, Im uh, the Immortan, the Immortan Joe. Excellent. Um, so, listen, congratulations. Uh, I'm, I think everyone here is super excited to see Fury Road, and we have to wait a little bit longer. But uh, everything you've shown here is incredible, and it's been wonderful to meet you, and I wish you the best with this movie. I know we're super excited to see it. And uh, a huge hand for George Miller, please. May 15th. from Warner Brothers and Village Roadshow Pictures comes out February 6th of next year as well. Um, there's more panel. I'm going to be exiting the stage because, uh, no, I'm telling you, when you, the next thing is better than me, I promise you. No, I'm not, I'm not trying to get love and attention. I am not the best. You shut up, Mom. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, I honestly, just really quickly, I cannot tell you how much I look forward to coming here and being in Hall H every year. I would never get into these panels if I didn't moderate them. So, uh, but it is, it is the highlight of my year to come and see you guys and see how excited you are and, and just watch how much, uh, how much excitement comes out of you. So thank you so much. I will see you later this afternoon right here in Hall H. Uh, enjoy the rest of the panel, you guys. We'll see you later. Tell the master of Lake Town that the Hobbit panel is about to begin. Swift boy, run! Steven! Hello. If I could only go back in time and show this to my 13-year-old self. and a celebration of Peter Jackson's move Middle Earth, the battle for six movies. My name is Stephen Colbert, and if you were anything like me, you don't just love these stories, you treasure the world of J.R.R. Tolkien. Let me 
take you to a time long ago, an earlier age, the time of Clinton, the dark days of dial-up internet. A rumor came to us that director Peter Jackson would be making an adaptation of the trilogy. At the time, many of us knew him only from his movie, Heavenly Creatures. And as great as that movie is, I wasn't sure there was room for hysterical, murderous teenage girls in Middle Earth. Other than, of course, Eowyn. I was worried that somehow he would take away my treasure, my hoard of precious Middle Earth stories. It was a very possessive, obsessive, very dragony feeling. So I found and followed everything I could about the progress of these movies. I remember seeing the first stills from the filming of Helm's Deep. I looked at every casting announcement. I scoured the work of John Howe and Alan Lee. I read the online debates about fantasy versus fairy tales. And I began to have hope. Not just hope the movies would be good, I was given hope that finally, finally people might not roll their eyes when I started talking about Middle Earth. <laughs> That my head full of facts from Fionor to Faramir might suddenly have some social value. That someone might say to me, hey Stephen, you know a lot about Tolkien, can you explain something to me? And I would say, yes, oh God, yes I will. <laughs> upon the world and to steal a line from C.S. Lewis, here were beauties that pierced like swords or burned like cold iron. Here were movies that would break your heart, good beyond hope. And rather than taking away our treasure, Peter and Fran Walsh and Philippa Boyens and Richard Taylor and Grant Major and Dan Hanna and the cast and the crew and Weta Digital and the land and the people of New Zealand itself added to our stories, complemented our imagination. The only problem, as I saw it, was that at a total running time of 11 and a half hours, they were too damn short. <laughs> feel, feel, this must be how Orlando Bloom feels all the time. <laughs> we wanted more! And though we had to wait nearly a decade, our patience was rewarded with the cast and creative team we love and trust, and we were invited back to Hobbiton, to Rivendell, across the misty mountains cold, to, through water, wood, and hill, by reed and willow, to finally come face to face with the beautiful but dangerous silver-tongued villain of the Hobbit, the Lake Down Spy. I just hope I fulfilled Professor Tolkien's vision. Before we bring out the panel, we have a few more clips to show you. Now these are clips from all five of the previous released Lord of the Rings and Hobbit movies, many of which have never been seen, starting with one very powerful scene starring another member of the Lake Town Spy Network whose moving performance, for some reason, Peter Jackson decided to cut. Let's roll it. start off for, for everyone on stage right now. Do you get that everywhere you go at this point? <laughs> or just everywhere in San Diego? <laughs> Peter, how are you? Hey. Yes. Uh, I'm very good, thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much for coming. Well, on behalf, uh, on behalf of myself and everyone here and all the fans around the world over the last, how many years now since the first movie came out? 13? Yeah. Thank you. Something, something like that, yeah. Thank you very much for making these movies. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. I do, I do have to send apologies from Martin and Ian and Richard, who would all love to be here, but um, Martin and Richard are on stage in London and unable to get away. And, no, uh, yeah, Ian's shooting a movie, that's right, yes. That's what's happening, isn't it? Yes. But, uh, but they do send their love, and um, I'm sure you'll see them again sometime on some other project. So Peter, are you done with the last movie yet? Uh, no, no, we're still working. Um, we're, uh, 
We sort of, I mean, the creation of the movie never really stops, and so what we are doing at the moment, I mean, it's editing, but it's a lot more than edit editing because we, because we are, um, we've, got, we've got battle sequences to do um, and a lot of other, you know, rather intricate things, and, and, and so we are doing motion capture for that, um, or we're doing animation, you know, in the case of some of the big creatures, and, and we're. Uh, and so I'm supervising that, then that goes on to the motion capture stage, then I go on with a virtual camera and I film it, which I absolutely love doing. So I'm still shooting the movie in essence, they haven't, they haven't stopped me filming it yet. Um, and well, if you're, and you're looking, then, then, if you're looking to shoot a together. big battle, I think we have 6,000 extras who might be able to do that. I know, they would be good too, wouldn't they? I'm good! about how the, the movies are made. As you said, you're doing a lot of this motion capture and going into the digital environment for the camera to capture things. Hmm. The people who've worked together on stage, have is this the first time some of you have met here at Comic-Con, even though you've done the movie together? Yes. Yeah. 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 yes. <laughs> have any of you ever been in scenes together and never met before? Yes. Uh, yes. 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 <laughs> We worked together, and I, I, I didn't meet Kate until well after I'd finished working with her. <laughs> really? It seems to be my run of things. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. Did either of you complain that the other person was stealing focus? Yeah, she took ages to come out of her trailer, and uh, you know. But you had that big long. I kept eating tail. snacks, and I was in your way all the time. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> Kind of amazing. Peter, when you started back in 19... Was it 1995 when you first started about doing these movies? Um, yeah, 95 or 96, I think, some, sometime like that. So by the time this film is released, once it's released, and still, it'll still be running in 19, uh, 2015, you will have spent 20 years thinking about this world. Did you imagine that this was going to take a generation of your life? <laughs> <laughs> and is that a happy thing for me to say? <laughs> Um, well, it's a commitment, isn't it? Really, it's a commitment. Um, but no, I, I and it's a commitment I really have really enjoyed taking. It's been a you know you never you never know what's going to happen next. I mean, the very first thing that we ever pitched to Miramax back in '95 was it was um, to make The Hobbit as a single movie, and if that was successful, we'd do two Lord of the Rings movies. So that, that was the pitch. That was what we and it was well, sort of things went a bit differently, didn't they? But anyway. <laughs> But, um, but yes, so, you, sorry, wait, it was originally pitched to be two movies? Yeah, well, The Hobbit was going to be, we were going to shoot The Hobbit first as one movie, and then if that was successful, we would do Lord of the Rings back to back, two movies. And that was the pitch to Miramax. That, well, that was the original pitch. And so I, I, you know, that was, you certainly, everything just changes, it's organic. So you, it's, I mean, it's not, I mean, it would be really boring if it was 20 years where you had it all laid out, you knew exactly what was going to happen, and you were just ticking the boxes, but it's certainly, it's, it's an adventure, every step of us, an adventure. I, I do want to complain to you again, as I have before, that since The Hobbit, which is one book, became three movies, technically you owe us six more movies for the trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> sure, if Warners could find a way to do that, they would, they would certainly be very happy. <laughs> uh, Elijah? Yes, sir. Oh, hello. You're doing this. This is amazing. Yeah, it is. It no, is. I, I, I realized that. Why? Why don't you age? <laughs> <laughs> and Peter, did you know you were casting the immortal? <laughs> no, maybe I have a painting in my attic that's aging for me. It kind of goes. The same thing also goes for the elves. I mean, uh, Orlando. creams they're putting down on you, but darling, I want some. All of the cream! <laughs> That's a good idea, we should come out with one, shouldn't we? An <laughs> elf of ice cream. I do have, as a fan, I do have a question for the elves, people who played elves in, in the movie. So, um, since elves are uh, immortal... You can call you, us elves, we like it. Uh, you you like being elves? distinguish between people who played elves and people who are elves. <laughs> <laughs> you might be an elf. <laughs> Do, do, do elves, do you have to think differently, or are you thinking as a human? Do you have to put yourself in the mind of an immortal when you do this? Do you have pity on the rest of your cast members when you're in the character? I was, I was typecast. Yes? <laughs> They're incredibly generous. 
Oh, look, I was just grateful to get a job in this one. I, I thought my time was over in Middle Earth. So. Yeah, you and me both. Uh. <laughs> Are elves generous, do you mean? Or have P Peter been generous to bring you back? What do you mean? Uh, a, bit, a bit of both. Okay. No, but I do, I do think Galadriel's incredibly um, generous. It was a big stretch for me. <laughs> <laughs> just to get you out of the trailer, you mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Now, Peter, can we talk about the tone of the movies when, when um, the trilogy of The Hobbit was announced? My understanding is that the tone of the movies was sort of progress toward the tone of the Lord of the Rings movies and sort of match up when you watch them all together. Um, how would you say the tone has changed from the first movie, from An Unexpected Journey to Desolation of Smog? And how's that extended in this movie? Well, it's, I mean, I think it's extended the way that you would imagine it would extend seeing the first two. It's, it's a progression, and it's certainly, um, I, I mean, it's about everybody in this room knows what's going to happen at the end of The Hobbit, never mind. Um, you know, there are, there are there's sad, a lot of sadness and tragedy, and, um, you know, which is good. It's always great when you can kill, kill off some main characters. I'll tell you what, it's, like, it's a filmmaker, thank God. Like when you can finally kill somebody, because um, it, it gives you a chance to do something, you know, hopefully that's powerful and emotional, and uh, otherwise you're a little bit. I mean, it's, it's so anyway. We we um, we do get to kill a few of them this time round, so it's good. And um, I think you'll 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 feel it getting quite. Yeah, well, I mean, dark, dark isn't the word. I mean, it, it's, I mean, these are fun movies. But they're fun, you know. Even I mean, the Rings movies were fun. I don't. They're just, they're, you know. But this, the, yes, it's not as comical as the first um, Hobbit movie for sure. And they're progressively getting towards the um, the tone of the Fellowship of the Ring. Do you know, Elijah was 18 years old when the Fellowship. By the way, I was just I was trying to work it out. And he's still 18 years old. <laughs> table and everyone thought I didn't know what the answer was but I was just trying to think of the first line of the poem <laughs> and so I raised my head and said oh slender is a willow wand oh clearer than clear water fair river daughter oh springtime and summertime spring again no, still, after still, still, oh wind still, on the waterfall and the leaves laughter Probably. Normally, normally winners, normally winners are very modest, aren't they? <laughs> I'll never have this opportunity again. <laughs> now, uh, I, I've noticed that there is a difference in in class in Elvendom, and Orlando. Um, <laughs> your father does not want you to date down. <laughs> Perhaps the two of you could address this. Is there a social, is there, is there a social message in, in this movie? Yes, I'm a low-class elf. Is that what you want me to say? You are. You want me to admit yes. it to the You're world? You're a trash I'm elf. low-class, <laughs> trashy elf. Trash. But my shit still sparkles. <laughs> was that on your resume? Is that how you got the gig? <laughs> that was on their wish see. list. We've heard of Angelina Lee's shit sparkles. We like her as an elf. <laughs> um, well, Peter, I think uh, based on the time, I think maybe we've... Um, Oh, where are we? We're at, uh, we're at, uh, we're, at, we're okay, we can do, we're okay. we're do All right. another f five, five minutes or, or ten minutes of questions. All right. Have you, have you run, run out of questions? Any of the actors here, any of the actors here, I'd like to ask about your experience in New Zealand. You know, Lee, for instance, have you been to New Zealand before? <laughs> Before, but I absolutely made the most of it. I love being outside and hiking and stuff, and you can't find a better place for that than New Zealand. Like, awesome, awesome hikes. Really, really fun. I had, I had a feeling when I went, we went down there, again, Peter invited us down very kindly, my wife and my two boys and I were extras, and we spent two weeks down there. I had a strong feeling that I should never leave New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was really like, this is where I will be a man. <laughs> Really, it calls to you and says, "If you are you as raw as this mountain is, <laughs> could you carve out a life plus no bears?" <laughs> That's right. That's nice. Does anybody have any particular? Did anybody do any adventure travel down there? Because there are a lot of ways to kill yourself not being killed by an animal in New Zealand. Did anybody take advantage of any of this sort of I did, adventure? I went up. Um, I went. I went heli. I, I can say this now because I'm out of contract. But I did got a glacier while I was uh, uh, down there. They, and you didn't tell anyone. They helicoptered us up to the middle of the Fox Glacier and then left us there for a few hours. Brilliant. And we went through ice caves. Yeah. And 
Oh, no, no, me and Aidan jumped out of an air aeroplane as well at one point. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the sort of country where you can do a lot of that jumping. Yeah. I jumped out of things, jumped off things. If anything I could get thrown out of or off, I would pretty much do. Dorlando, did you, did you move down there for any period of time? Like three years. Yeah. <laughs> After the movie was over, I understood yes, that you, st you stayed, stayed for a while. Mm, I was... No, I've sort of come and gone a bit, but it's sort of, it's funny actually, because there was an email exchange between me and Dom and Elijah just two days ago talking about getting residency in New Zealand. Dom was like, <laughs> we really started applying for complicated residency. complicated than me. Me and Billy sure. thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Only, only throws himself off anything and with a bungee on, it's like, it's <laughs> amazing, I mean, un unbelievable. Did any of you come to the stories uh, of uh, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit for the first time through the films? And did it make you then go back to the books, or did you say, to hell with that, I'm never going to read them? <laughs> <laughs> Elijah, did you go back and read the books? I actually haven't. Truth be told, I still haven't read the books. <laughs> oh, never? I know yeah, what I'm getting you for Christmas. Listen, I've said this before. Get out of here! <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> Okay. Elijah, um, do you know how to read? I do. Because <laughs> you've been in show business since you were a child. I, I read The Hobbit when I was a child, and it was a big, big book for me. Um, and I had The Lord of the Rings on my shelf, and it was one of those things that was very daunting and was kind of always there, and I thought, I'll get to that one day. And then these movies came about, and I sort of, I felt like I was living it and experienced it in such a profoundly deep way that I, I never really consulted the books. I imagine it's something that I will go back to, but... I don't know, it was such an experience over the course of such a long period of time. I, I loved reading Lord of the Rings so much when I was young that um, when I got about 25 pages to the end of Return of the King, I took my book and I reverently closed it and I said, I will never read those pages because this story must go on. Oh. <laughs> and I have never read those pages. Really? Oh, that's beautiful. Ever. Oh, Evan Evangeline is a serious geek, a serious Tolkien geek. Hey, no, 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 I love, 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 love Tolkien, but I don't know squat. Like, I can't remember the names, the places, so I fail every Tolkien geek test. Don't try. <laughs> but I love him. Oh, he's so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's ready to talk. No, I'm not disappointed again. at all. Actually, you've never been more attractive. <laughs> What do you think of my hair? Should I keep this? <laughs> Fantastic. A uh, Andy, Hello. tell me, tell me about your, tell me about the work. Tell us all about the work you're doing in London now with your company. Well, uh, well, look, I mean, it's been an extraordinary uh, 15 years. When uh, when Peter asked me to, to come, when I met Peter and Fran in London uh, back in 1999, I think it was. Um, and, and the, the, the idea of, of playing this creature, Gollum, came up, uh, and, and there wasn't like an exact method of how it was going to be done. And, but, but basically, Peter wanted an actor to come on set and be there and play the character, and not have Elijah and, and uh, Sean have to imagine someone. Um, it basically changed the course of my life to su with such magnitude. Um, of course, you know, it, it, not only was it about finding a way of bringing that character to the screen, but also creating a methodology of work, which again, you know, I then went on. I mean, actually, I have to say, the, the epiphany for me of, 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 of kind of where, where I'm at today came immediately in the last uh, weeks of doing Return of the King, because on my birthday, it was the 20th of April, and I think it was 2003, the last pickups for, for, uh, for Return of the King, and it was, my, it was my birthday, and Peter asked me on, on that day, it was literally, right at the end of the pickups to, to, to play King Kong. And I suddenly kind of realized, I've just, I thought my life was gonna go back to a normality, to play normal characters in normal films, <laughs> a normal traditional way. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and then the, the idea, it sort of hit me overnight, hold on a minute, I've just played this three and a half foot ring junkie, and now I'm gonna, <laughs> now I'm gonna play a 25 foot gorilla, wow. This means typecasting is no more. You know? <laughs> this means you can do anything. You can put on one pair of spandex suits and um, go and enjoy yourself on the carpet and uh, play, play any, any manner of things. And, and that kind of fascination and enjoyment really has continued over the years. And most of which has been, again, involved with Peter and, and learning with Weta, who are the most fantastic, amazing bunch of people to work with. <laughs> And you know, it, 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 it's it's a it's a sort of knowledge base and a, and a skill set, and uh, which I 
which I love and adore, and I do think philosophically as an actor, it does break down so many barriers. You can play anything, any, any whatever you are, it doesn't matter. You can play anything. Um, and uh, and Weta, they're, they're, they're incredible, and the work that they've continued to do uh, in, in, in the facial pipeline, and, and you know, going back to play God on the second time, and seeing how that all moved on, and how the performances are really beautifully rendered now, and very truthful to what, what happens on the set between the director and so on. And it's it's been a fantastic, amazing, unbelievable journey of which, of course, I never had any, uh, I, had, I couldn't foresee coming at all. And, and and it's ended up with being in a position where very very luckily now trying to bring it to the Northern Hemisphere, because <laughs> I realise it doesn't actually exist in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, in, in, uh, in, it's particularly in Europe. So we have a, a place called the Imaginarium, which is sort of, I, I see as a sort of, uh, you know, Northern Hemisphere uh, touch base for, for, for anyone who's, who's happening to be doing OE from New Zealand who wants to drop by and, and work there. So um, it's, 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 a great, it's a great time, really enjoying it, and, uh, you know, and it's very much down to, to, uh, to Peter and Fran and Philippa and all the incredible experience they've had. Well, thank you. Just on something, just on something that's been really interesting, you said you thought you'd be going back to normal films <laughs> after doing this. But I think after, certainly after the first three films, what it meant to make a normal film had changed. And the work that you did actually, sort of as the, the Lon Chaney of the digital world, is to change what could be done on screen and for Peter and his, and his team to change um, what, well for one thing, what spectacle means in a movie. Certainly after the Battle of the Planner Fields in the third movie, I said immediately after the battle's over, nothing can ever be called spectacle again without first being compared to this event. And so, um, how do you think do you see the change that's happened in film? Like every battle, two people, two people clashing, like close shots of people clashing in a battle on screen these days, looks something like it's an echo of that Dagger Lad battle at the beginning of the prologue for the first Fellowship of the Ring. Everything's got that, that rush and that clash feeling that just didn't exist before. Do you, do you see your work being echoed? I, I did a little bit, yeah. I did recognize some of our the sort of style and some films that came through in, in, you know, in, the, in the years following. But I mean, that's amazing. I mean, as a filmmaker, there's no better compliment than to feel that you've, you know, you've influenced the, the way in which other filmmakers, you know, the tools that they can use and the way that they might, might want to shoot their movies. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I've got, I'm in the middle of doing a battle right now, actually. Big battle, battle of the five armies. Would you by any chance, or would you by any chance have any way to give us an idea of what that movie is like? Well, we could, um, we could screen our teaser trailer if people want to have a look at the teaser trailer. First um, screening of the Battle of the Five Armies teaser trailer. Should we? Thank you. <laughs> it's all right. That was that was really just just for you, Stephen. I mean, these other people had, were here as well. That was really just for you. <laughs> private screening. Thank you for not giving away the part where the leader of the spy network saves the day. <laughs> Kate, Galadriel is kissing on Gandalf in there. What's going on? It's, a, it's an ancient love story. It was actually born um, the first time around. I was so sad because um, I, I, you know, I adore Ian, as does everyone here. But I hardly got to do anything with him at all. What? I mean, anything at all. Um, and, uh, no, because I, I mean, I, I, in the first story, it was just, it was Clancy. Oh, you mean in the first one, of course, you don't Yeah, yeah, the first time, story. first time around, backwards. And so it was so special. And, and also having worked with Hugo so intensely on stage over the last 10 years, just sort of 10 years later to go back and then, you know, all the core story, because of course, Galadriel's just a footnote in, in, the, in the Hobbit, really. Um, to have such a beautiful, loving um, relationship of understanding. Did you wear any of the original costume? Did they bring any of the costumes? I thought you said I wear underwear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, Elves don't I wear underwear. I figurine didn't have. My boys were horrified because they weren't born the first time around. They were, to see the, the, the figurines and that elves didn't in fact wear underwear, so I didn't. 
But that, that wasn't what you were going to wear. That's a bit, that was a bit too much sharing. <laughs> I think Ian I did think, wear I underwear. Think, I think you buried the lead on that story. <laughs> no, did you wear any of the original costumes from the first three movies in, in The Hobbit movie? No, it was all, well, I think the crown was the same. But it was all, it was all kind of rebooted and revamped, but of a theme. Yeah, I wasn't wearing, I wearing trousers. Did, did, um, did, did we use any original cost? Elijah, did you read it? We, uh... I don't think it was an actual original. I think it was a remake. I mean, we, te we tend costume. to keep the original costumes. They're sort of sacred now, so we, we kind of don't, put, don't get sweat in them again. <laughs> um, you know, there's, I mean, we're hoping to do a, little, a, a museum one day where we can have all this stuff on display. So. So we, we, you know, we didn't really want to trash the, the Lord of the Rings stuff for, for the Hobbit generally, so we tended to make new stuff. New, I did have my wig. Things. My wig was the same. Yeah, my wig was oh, the really? same. My wig was the same. Yeah, we had two wigs from Lord of the Rings, and we. But were your we ears different? Reasoned. My ears. Well, your ears no, continued to grow. You yeah. had the same ears. But well, they had to recall. They had to recall. Wait a second. Your ears didn't fit anymore. Ears. No, he was growing his ears, ears to try and get them to be half as beautiful as Tauriel's <laughs> big pointy ears. <laughs> We have an ear thing, sorry, Tario was obsessed with that yeah, big pointy ears, and I was like, I think they should be a little subtler than that, honey, but she was like, no, I'm, ha I'm going all the way on this ear. I know how sexy a big pointy ear can be. <laughs> oh, yeah. They were a bit more aerodynamic. This time around? Yeah. I felt. yeah. But you can only say that in retrospect. I mean, you know. Um, Peter, speaking of saving things from the Lord of the Rings, one of the things that people may not know is that you've got these huge warehouses in Wellington with all the old well, stuff. Well, they know now, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. Our secret, really our secret warehouses, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah. 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 It was just one of the greatest experiences of my life was to walk oh, through. Yeah. Yeah. The Misty Mountains. Yes. Misty Mountains, uh, you know, uh, go to Minas Tirith, mm -hmm. to stand in front, tower over Minas Tirith or Rivendell, mm -hmm. or to actually take a quick look, to really take a look at what you had at the Grey Havens. Because in the movie, you don't get to see any of the mountains no, with the pillars No, 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 the Grey Havens is a beautiful, beautiful miniature. It's a beautiful miniature, and as you say, it was never really seen, so. Yeah, it's, an incre no, it's incredible. No, beautiful, yeah. Well, we just, yeah, I mean, we've got it all, we've kept it all, and so, you know, we've kept it all for a reason. I want to try to, to let people see it one day, so, more, more than just you. I mean, it was nice having you there, Stephen, but it'd be nice to have these folk up there as well. <laughs> One thing that you don't see in the movie, I don't know whether you took it out digitally, but when I went and looked at Grand, when you have Grand, the, like the, the, it's like the 12 foot long version of Grand there, the, the Warhammer that knocks down the gates of Minasteria, is that it's a wolf, you know, a ravening wolf with fire coming out of its mouth, but the prop itself has a penis. <laughs> the wolf that you made. It's a penis and it's got a very, it's very sharp. <laughs> it's kind of a terrifying, Image. How do you know the wolf's penis is sharp? Did you touch it? <laughs> I'm, I'm a super fan. I, I mean, I didn't actually realise it until, until you, you pointed it out. <laughs> but right. no, it, wasn't, it wasn't removed. I mean, no one ever asked no. us to remove it in the film. Did you remove it? No. Must be there somewhere. It's there. Yeah. Stephen, it's because of people like you running around and touching wolf's penises that Comic Con is a scary place to be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> question. You ready to do some fan questions? Yeah. Everybody up there? We've got microphones in, let's see, where are they? Right over here, where the light is. <laughs> and the young woman wearing the armor of buttons. <laughs> Yes. This this is the Lord of the Rings cape and Hobbit cape. Everything on here is Lord of the Rings wow. Hobbit. Um, in ten years, I expect to be back here uh, watching clips from the Cimmerillion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first things first. In dragon voice, Benedict, could you say "button lady"? Button <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. lady. <laughs> Um, my question is for uh, a couple of the elves. 
we've seen that two shot of Bard and Legolas. My question is, does Legolas teach Bard about archery, or does Bard teach Legolas about archery? Whoa. Ooh, I like the way you go with that. We have a, we have a bow off. <laughs> you do get to kill the dragon, I suppose. Um, do you want the sensible answer, or do you want a silly answer? Silly. <laughs> silly answer. Both. Uh, did you ever... Bob told me everything I know. I've seen your archery skills. <laughs> the truth is, both of these guys are particularly good at archery in real life. Uh. And so, they're both sort of quietly, I think, thinking, how do I tell them I'm really good? Uh, <laughs> that this guy's okay, but I'm really good. <laughs> but, you know, over the years, there's all this rumor of, uh, there's more footage out there we haven't seen. Is it going to be in the big six disc set? Um, how are we going to see an even longer cut of Lord of the Rings down the road? Or have we seen the definitive version of those original three <laughs> <laughs> Um Well, I, yeah, I, I mean, there, there is a few scenes that haven't been seen from the Lord of the Rings, um, but not many. Very, very few. Um, what were those scenes? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you one day. Don't worry. One, we'll just keep. That's. Um, I, I, I mean, there was. There was a. There was a. Um, Arwen and Aragorn scene, but wasn't it when they were younger and um, when they first met? Um, and Vigo and Vigo looked like he was 12 years old. <laughs> well, they helped the computers. So it was quite, quite amazing. Um, um, but no, there, there is a, a few scenes, and, and but I, I, I don't know. We might try to put them back in. I mean, there, it's 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 not without its issues because the Lord of the Rings was seven million feet of 35 mil film, which is sitting in a mountain in Arizona somewhere. I think at the moment. Seriously, I think that's where I think that's where Warner Brothers have some vault somewhere, a nuclear a nuclear proof vault somewhere where all the, all the negative, like our seven, the seven million feet of our film is sitting in, which we'd have to go and retrieve it. So um, it, it's a big logistical thing, which I don't think anyone's quite got their heads around. But if there's enough um, interest from people, maybe they will. All right, before we go, you have a, 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 a contest to announce here, Peter. It's the Hobbit Fan Fellowship Contest. You're inviting ultimate fans to sign up for a chance to win a trip to New Zealand. Experience the cinematic Middle Earth. So what sort of things might these people be doing, these fans? How many and, and what would they be doing? And is Stephen allowed to participate? <laughs> Cast are not allowed. Cast don't, you're not, don't even try. <laughs> um, you're gonna, you, there's gonna be more information on the internet about how you, you know, how you get into this. It's like, is, we're gonna be choosing um, people to come down in um, early November and they're gonna, you're gonna be the first people in the world to look at the Battle of the Five Armies with me sitting in a cinema in New Zealand. It may not even be finished, it may not quite be finished, but it'll be close to being finished. Well, actually, I'm supposed to say it'll be finished because the studio's here, right? But, um, um, you know, who knows? It'll be, it'll be finished or very, very close to being finished. And, and, but no, no one, virtually hardly anyone ever outside of the people working on the post-production will have ever seen a single, um, had, 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 will have, you know, a single scene at that point. So you're going to see it exclusively, first time, um, and I'll be there and we'll chat and... We might even get to show you, show you some of these secret warehouses and things too. <laughs> so, so Stephen, and I think, you, I think there's also um, trips to the South Island involved too. There's like a little tour of New Zealand, um, a tour to Hobbiton. And, um, and we're, going to, we're, we're going to open this up and make it, uh, and, and, and we're going to pick 75 people. We just thought we'd end in style. So 75 people plus a partner. Each of the 75 can bring a partner, so that's... That's um, more than 75 people. Yeah. <laughs> Look for details on the Facebook page or at the hobbitfancontest.com. And we'd like to thank Air New Zealand, the official airline of Middle Earth, and Tourism New Zealand for their support to make this contest happen. And, um, Peter, do you want to announce this? There's right now, right Yeah, now. well, we've already. Um, 
selected our first two people to come down. We've had the Lake Town Spy Network has gone out and been talking to fans to find, you know, fans that we think would be appreciative of coming down. And um, if, if you're, if, and the, um, and so we, we would, we've, we've chosen two. We'd love to choose more than two, but you can all apply. You, you can, can all, it's not even applying, it's like you've got to do stuff, but you'll wait, wait till the, the details come out on the net. Um, but the two are Chris McMeans. Are you here? Chris <laughs> McMeans from Austin, Texas. In Austin, Texas, yeah. Chris. Morgan Bergener. Morgan Morgan Bergener of San Diego. Are you here, Morgan? If you are, if if you are, if, if, can you can you make your way to the microphone? Can can you make your can you make your way to the um the question mic um, at the end of the presentation? And a Warner's representative will meet you. But um yeah, but but uh, seriously, that's only two out of seventy-five. So there's still seventy-three places to go and um, we will hopefully see some of you down in New Zealand in November for this, um, this uh, secret screening.